Okay, guys, so now we're going to talk about the Texas Revolution. Um, this is the uh, lecture we started last week, well, the week before break. So we're going to talk about that, and I'm just going to start from the beginning in case you're missing pieces in your notes or if you lost your notes, but uh, we're just going to start from the beginning to make it all put together. All right, so we're talking first about the Battle of Gonzales. Remember, the Battle of Gonzales is the beginning. It's the start of the... Uh, uh, the Texas Revolution. Uh, it all has to be centered over that cannon uh, where the Texans want to keep it. The Mexican government wants to take it back because, after all, it is a cannon. Uh, we talked about it being a very small cannon, but it's still a cannon. Um, Texans refused. They made a flag. Come and take it. That's that whole connection there. Uh, a lot of people talk about this as the Lexington of the Texas Revolution. Um, we talked a little bit about that maybe not being a fair comparison, um, as you know. But this is Texas history, and we like to to magnify things sometimes. But uh, understand the cannon we're talking about. This is your your cannon here. Let me uh, zoom out just a wee bit so you can see that better. But the idea there is that it is pretty small. Uh, you can see here that it, sorry about that, that it fires a cannonball that's about an inch and a half in diameter. Six graders, I apologize, the track is closed. Eat your breakfast. Yes, eat your breakfast and the track is closed. Yay, sixth graders. All right, so the idea here is that, yeah, it's a small cannon, but it's still a cannon. <clears throat> we talked about the importance of if you take this thing away from the Texans, perhaps that's a, a, a moral victory or not a moral victory or a morale uh, victory for your side and a uh, serves to dishearten or, you know, put down the, the power that the enemy might have. So here we go. Let's talk more about why would Gonzales be considered the Lexington of the Texas Revolution. That gets us to this slide where we're talking about uh, the comparison. So Battle of Lexington goes into a lot of detail about it. The biggest part of this uh, is this right here. Okay, It's fought over possession of weapons. Uh, arsenal, rifles, ammunition, and then this is fought over possession of weapons or a cannon. Now, the idea there is that I think the, the possession of an arsenal, the ability to outfit multiple soldiers, is probably a bigger deal than the ability to outfit a small group of guys with a cannon that shoots quarters at people. Um, so I, that's where I have a problem with this comparison. Uh, it's also when you start thinking about this, um, this, this comes from that narrative. And that's what we also talked about, you know, seeing the bias in our, even our, in our own curriculum. This is a bias that comes from people who are very big supporters of the Second Amendment and gun rights. Um, so just, you know, whether or not your, whatever your views on guns are, realize that this is there. All right, next up, let's talk about capture of San Antonio. Okay, so after the Battle of Gonzales, morale is really high for the Texans. They're like, woohoo, we just beat the, you know, the Mexican army. So now they want to head to San Antonio and kick the Mexican army out, out of the entire state of Texas. And when I say state of Texas, I mean Mexican state. Um, so they're electing Stephen F. Austin as their general. Uh, Martin Perfecto de Cas is the leader of the Mexicans at San Antonio. Ben Milam, he's that guy who is trying to get everybody roused up, ready to go, because the battle is kind of stalemated. And finally he's like, yeah, who's going to go with old Ben Milam to the, you know, attack the mission? And, well, he jumps up and promptly gets shot. But uh, the idea here is that they... That, that attack led to uh, the troops being pushed out, uh, General Cost being forced to leave San Antonio, uh, agrees to never fight again. Um, and this is, this is a personal attack on Santa Ana because 
Perfecto de Cas is his brother-in-law. So it personally shames uh, his family. So that's kind of a frustrating thing for uh, good old Santa Ana. Now we start talking about Santa Ana heading to San Antonio. He's bringing the majority of the Mexican army. So he's getting ready to, in his mind, most likely put down a rebellion. Now on his way, he's going to meet up with General Koss. So when he meets up with General Koss, he turns General Koss around and they all head back towards the Alamo. So <clears throat> that leads us to the convention of 1836. This is where Washington on the Brazos, March 1836, is this idea of, of what are we gonna do? Now that we've started this revolution, what do we do? So 59 delegates meet. They decide Santa Ana is never gonna reinstate the Mexican Federal Constitution of 1824, because that's what they originally wanted. They wanted that state's rights constitution that Santa Ana said he was going to support and then went against. <clears throat> so they decide to uh, declare independence from Mexico and Texas is off and rolling as a republic if it can survive the revolution. So here we have the Texas Declaration of Independence, March 2nd, 1836, um, written by George Childress. So remember that name. There's going to be a test question about him. What did he do? Now, he lists the grievances. This word is really important. The reason it's important because it's patterned off of what goes on in the uh, Declaration of Independence for the United States. They list their complaints about what the mother country is doing. So in the American Revolution's case, the, the founding fathers list their grievances with the King of England and what's going on with England. Here, the same thing is being done for the grievances or complaints about Mexico. Denied them the rights guaranteed by the Constitution of 1824. That's their big sticking point. Uh, we get to uh, talking about Texans were deprived of freedoms. They were used to, uh, f you know, from the U.S. Constitution. So this idea is that they're used to the U.S. kind of Constitution system of government. It's a cultural problem where Mexico is, is a different country. It's not America. So these Americans who come down there thinking that it's going to be just like home, not exactly. And especially now that it's it's diverged even further after they've abandoned the Constitution of 1824. So uh, culture shock for these guys. Now we get to a provisional or temporary government. So what a provisional government is, is just temporary. Um, you get delegates at 1836 convention. They're, they're basically saying it's not safe to hold an election. So we just got to set up a government that can run the battles and things like that and get things going. So they, they just do that. They elect people out of those, those delegates. So the delegates are chosen by the people in their own areas. And then those delegates choose representatives to run the government. So the temporary or ad interim president is David Burnett. And then the temporary vice president is Lorenzo de Zavala. So remember these names, guys. This, this is important so you understand who were our leaders during the revolution. All right, so Sam Houston, he's chosen by that same convention as uh, commander-in-chief of the Texas Army. Then we have <clears throat> William Goines. He's a free African-American. His, his purpose and the whole thing that he's trying to do and tasked with doing is negotiating peace treaty with the Cherokees during the Texas Revolution. If during the Texas Revolution, the Native Americans decided, hey, perfect time to strike while everybody's fighting, then they really could have dealt the Texans a blow and perhaps saved themselves their land. Or perhaps even if they had sided with the Mexican side of the revolution, then they could have come out a lot better in the end, I think. But they chose to make a peace treaty with the Texans, and you'll end up seeing in our, our next lecture what how Texans will repay that peace treaty in the end. 
All right, so the Alamo, February 23rd to March 6th. So here you have basically the outline of the Alamo here. This is, you know, where the, the whole mission would be, where the Native American quarters would be that would be turned into the battle ramparts where guys would stand on top of these buildings to shoot from. This ramp here where you would roll a cannon up, there's another one there. And then this is the part of the Alamo that you're familiar with right here. That's the, the actual building, the, the church that you would go into and tour right there. But you can see that the compound was much bigger. Okay. Now, let's talk about, you know, what flag did the Texans wave at the Battle of the Alamo? It's not this bad boy. It's going to be this one over here, 1824. All right. Moving on to William B. Travis. He's our commander uh, at the Alamo. He sent several letters out. You wrote about those. You read about those, so you should be very familiar with those. Uh, talked about how he is willing to die to defend the fort um, and, well, eventually does. <clears throat> so some of your big, big named guys there, the heroes of the Texas Revolution, James Bowie, William B. Travis, Davy Crockett, uh, close to 200 other Texans uh, die defending the Alamo. Of course, we have some new historical evidence that say some of these guys surrendered and, you know, you wrote about whether you think that diminishes their glory or not. So that's that's a debate for the, you know, topics of history to come. All right, so the events at the Alamo basically inspire Texans to carry on the struggle for freedom. They die as martyrs. And what a martyr is is somebody who dies for a cause and inspires others to essentially keep fighting. So this battle at the Alamo where all these defenders are killed, whether before or after the battle, inspires the rest of Texas to keep fighting. <clears throat> So here's the uh, Alamo, just kind of a, com a progression of it. So you have, you know, artist picture from 1836. You can see how it's kind of beat up there. Then it's repaired at some point before 1906, and then the present day. So just kind of give you an idea of what it looks like throughout history. All right, so our Texas Navy. Essentially, we had four ships, and their biggest thing was to bring supplies to the Texans Army uh, and cut off lines uh, to Mexican troops. So the bottom line is, if I'm in Texas with an army from Mexico, the quickest way is going to be seize ports and bring my supplies through those, those Texas ports. However, uh, you know, can't do that if you uh, have another Navy out there harassing you, cutting off your supplies, doing that sort of stuff. So that was the role of the Texas Navy. It's very small. Um, I think naming a ship Invincible, nah, that's dangerous. All right. Mr. Calderon, if you're on campus, can you please bust the front office, please, Mr. Calderon? All right. So the Battle of Coleto, we've got James Fannin and commander of Texas troops. At Goliad, Fannin gets orders from Sam Houston to return to retreat toward Victoria. He gets surrounded by Mexican troops, and this is a horrible battle. They are pinned down to the ground, like behind their own baggage. So if you had like a trunk with your stuff in it, that's this little tiny thing that you could carry, or you had a wagon full of supplies tipped on its side, you're literally lying in a little depression, and the Mexicans are shooting at you, you're shooting at them. This was a really rough battle for these these Texans because they're completely surrounded. Alright, so now the Goliad Massacre. So Fannin surrenders to General Urea, but there's conditions of the surrender that, that they're, they're, and what happens they vary. Um, basically, uh, Fannin was assured or, or promised that they'd be treated uh, you know, and released to the, either to the United States or at least treated fairly. So Colonel Fannin and his troops, it's about 350 guys, they're all executed. Um, some of them are able to run away, you know, during the, the execution. So guys are marched out, and when they're marched out on the road in three different groups, they start getting fired at. Well, some of those men run away and tell the tale. The basic idea here, though, is this is another case 
where the Texans get very angry because of the treatment that Mexico is giving them. It's another thing that inspires further fight in the Texans. So rather than scaring the Texans and making the Texans abandon their posts and run away from the army, it just makes those that are there even angrier. And perhaps, you know, other Texans want to join up for the fight. All right, so the runaway scrape. During the runaway scrape, this is essentially a retreat. Okay, the Texas Army, it's short on troops, guns, ammunition, supplies, all that sort of stuff. Sam Houston is, is seeing the fall of the Alamo. He's seeing the massacre at Goli uh, Gonzales, or the Battle of Gonzales. You know, he, he's basically, he has to retreat because he knows he's not ready to uh, fight for Texas independence. He just doesn't have the men trained. He doesn't have the equipment. He'll lose the first battle with the full Mexican army. So he's got to run away. Um, as that's you know backing up towards the San Jacinto, he is being called a coward. People are talking bad about him, all that sort of stuff. But eventually he will back up far enough, gain enough support, stretch out the t uh, Mexican supply lines far enough so that uh, you know it, it feels better that he could attack. Also, Santa Ana makes a mistake, and that's at the Battle of San Jacinto, where uh, he goes into a, you know, a day of rest, Santa Ana does, to rest his troops. However, that's the perfect time for the Texans to attack. So they come across the, the, the field, they fire the twin sisters, which are these two cannons that the Texans were given by the people of the United States. They fire those two cannons into the Mexican encampment, um, and then horses ride, men charge. Before the Mexican army can get their stuff together, they're, you're, the Texans are am amongst them. So you're coming out of a tent, you're unarmed. You're running for your gun, but your guns have been seized by Texans, or you're, you know, the Texans are between you and your guns where you've piled them up for safekeeping. So just kind of a uh, uh, the perfect time to strike an attack. Now, Battle of San Jacinto, it's the final battle of the Texas Revolution. Numbers of Texan soldiers are 900, nine died. Not certain on that number, but I, you know, that's the reported sort of official number. Um, number of Mexican soldiers died, 1,200. Um, or excuse me, number of Mexican soldiers are 1,200, 600 died. Uh, Mexican, Mexico is defeated in about 18 minutes of actual fighting. Um, so number of soldiers at San Jacinto, so you can get an idea of what that looks like. So Texans are, are pretty well outnumbered. But surprise does a lot for you. So if you look at the number of Texas dead versus the number of Mexican dead, surprise can get you a long way in a battle. This is the actual battlefield at San Jacinto. So this is the area of land that they went out onto and uh, were encamped on there. So you can see that there's no way to get away from if you, you have to go through water to get away. Okay. All right, so now, whoops, getting too far ahead. You get your San Jacinto Monument. Um, doo -doo, um, we're going to skip some of this. All right, get down to the Treaty of Valesico. Treaty of Valesico, May 14th, 1836. There are two treaties signed by Santa Anna and David Burnett officially ending the Texas Revolution. There's a public treaty of Valesico and a private treaty of Valesico. So the thing to understand here, the public treaty declared Texas independent from Mexico. Mexico army had to return across the border. Prisoners would be exchanged. Santa Ana would be sent back. So that's the public treaty. The private treaty is a deal with Santa Ana because he's president. Santa Ana would persuade Mexican leaders to recognize Texas independence, acknowledge the Rio Grande as the border between Texas and Mexico. So the idea here is that in order for Santa Ana to live, he has to work 
to iron out this thing. If he doesn't, eh, you know, we still got you. Let's lock you up and keep war going. Honestly, I think if the war kept going and we didn't get Santa Ana's help, I think we lose that war. Um, because, again, we're still a very small force. All right, so the Republic of Texas, as it looked after the battle, uh, or after the final of the uh, Battle of San Jacinto and the treaties, uh, the borders of Texas uh, will claim as the new Republic of Texas after the revolution is over. So that's what we looked like when we were a country. All right, get notes on that and be prepared for the test.